What's up, folks? This is James the Pro with the Impossible Channel. I don't know if you know this, but my first video was focused on the ISS live feed. I was very much interested, and I still am, looking at space, the stars, the sun, and the moon. I love it. I just love nature. You know, I'm focused on nature all the time. Nature this, nature that. How, how's the weather? How's the ocean? Is it feeling as fine as I am? You know what I mean? I kind of love nature and well i was looking at space through the iss and this is one of my first videos on this channel right and i saw this huge thing and i thought it was nibiru or planet x and i and i was pretty sure it was well i posted a video on it it was my first video on this channel if you have the patience go for it you know and um that's you know some people ask me why did you open the channel james well because I spotted this on the ISS live feed and no one was talking about it. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that this is Planet X. I'm pretty sure that this is Nibiru. I gotta talk about this, right? So in the last couple of years or the last 10 years, uh, working inside offices in air conditioning systems, right? You know, I went out of these buildings here in South America and I just felt this heat wave it wasn't normal. You know, people here are kind of used to it, but I am not. I'm pretty sure I'm not used to it. So I was bothered by the heat and it was too much. And I asked people, are you feeling it? And people were like, no, I'm not feeling anything, James. It's like, it's normal, you know? Is it like this oh, hot, you know, oh, like unbearably hot? And people were like, yeah, now that you're saying it, now that you're putting it like that, it is unbearably hot, right? So little by little, things started to get worse to the point that people were making jokes of making eggs Man, on their cars, after a while. you know, frying eggs on their cars. And I was like, yeah, that, you know, that's just not funny. You know, like, um, I don't know if you remember this, folks. It was around 2006. This guy's backpedaling back and forth. So he doesn't get messed with. A lot of places around the world, it was already heating up, right? We were already talking about global warming. If I'm not mistaken, Al Gore had already come clean about chemtrailing and weather modification. People just started to enjoy it. You know, drinking beer here, beer there, uh, going to the beach, traveling, enjoying. Well, anyway, enjoying, right? Which is something that we're supposed to do, enjoy life. And that's exactly why chemtrailing and harp and weather modification might actually be something pretty bad. Because in the future, it might interrupt this enjoying life thing. At that time, I was pretty sure there was something wrong. Like, well, there's a planet coming. Sure, it might be Planet X, Nibiru. Something is wrong. We might have a second sun. So I started to take the sun. I started to do everything I could. I even uh, contacted some people that had these more expensive cameras and all that I got was nothing. There's nothing next to the sun, James, this and that. So one day I started looking at the live ISS feed and for my, uh, for, for my luck, I was kind of fortunate. Oh, I found this new saying? object that was pretty much like a huge planet or planetoid, maybe a ship just hovering next to earth. So I was like, yeah, Yes, I found it. Damn it, I found it. So I posted, this was my first video on YouTube. This is how it happened. This is how I started my channel. And some people really thought it was Nibiru like I did. And some other people went further and stopped to think about it. You know, how many window panes do they have on the ISS, right? And I was like, maybe they have more than one. Because we're talking about, you know, vacuum, space, whatever NASA says. I'm not saying that's true. That's what's happening. But if we, if we go with the flow, with what they're telling us it is, then they have to, they must have two, three, well, I don't know, four window panes before, um, you know what I mean? Like actually having contact with vacuum. So anyway, and the person, you know, responded well to my... I thought it was kind of uh, polite, you know, usually people are very impolite, uh, trolls, you know, it was kind of polite, it was no, I believe this is a window pane and what we're seeing is the reflection of one of the, the divisions the, the ISS has, right? one of the, the ISS's bodies. And when I 
paid attention to that, and I stopped to think about it, and I looked at the ISS structure, the way it was built, and where the camera was located, I was like, yeah, he's correct, it is. Indeed, that's not Planet X. So I, I came forward with that, I made a video. At the same time, we were getting a lot of videos of what's supposed to look like uh, two suns, or even sometimes three suns, uh, one next to another. Sometimes one sun over there, the other uh, in the opposite position. So it was something like, it was pretty simple. The video I thought I had captured of Nibiru or Planet X wasn't real, but it didn't discard the fact that people were indeed taping double suns or trinary systems, whatever out there. I believe that the ISS live feed is real at some point. For instance, they might, uh, it might actually be taping the, some parts of Earth, right, with uh, high altitude balloons, and they just record these uh, feeds on top of green screen, and they put what seems to be what looks like the ISS, right? So basically what I'm talking about is you put a high altitude balloon taping Earth for quite a long time, and then you make a composite image with a green screen of the ISS, right? Uh, that would work out for us human be human beings. I bet that would really uh, make it fool us for quite some time. And uh, this is because till today, there's a lot of people I talk to that do not believe in chemtrails or weather modification, despite the fact that a lot of presidents have talked about it. So or not, that some scientists are trying to figure out a way to block the sun to try to, to slow yeah. down global warming. Yeah, it's a measure of uh, the feeling of desperation that some of them feel. Are they really thinking they could do that? Well, if, yeah, some of them are seriously proposing, and I, I think it's completely nuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, you put a, another kind of pollution, sulfur dioxide, up to orbit the cover the atmosphere. The sky won't be really blue. In the way it is now anymore. Oh, no, I'm sure, certainly open to the fact that the planet Earth might be bigger. They might be hiding extra districts out there. But there's something that was brought to my attention, and this is the video sent by a subscriber of ours right after we released the ISS video. I mean, I believe that is a real UFO or uh, like a, some type of transport, right? From one district to another, maybe. Or um, that is a green screen error accompanied by the fact that we have a, a green band that has a wind effect of some sort and then they cut the feet so that's kind of weird um, the video i'm going to show you i'm probably showing you already this video has a big error a big mistake they forgot to take out a part of the video delete or mistakenly they put a part where you can see with all this 100% certainty that the ISS is computer graphics. But this does not discard the fact that the Earth might be actually being taped by a high altitude balloon, right? But it does bring some questions and uh, it does kind of shake the foundations of the live ISS feed. Now, I am a lover of the live ISS feed, despite the fact that it might be fake. You know, uh, the curvature might be a GoPro effect. The thing is, this footage that you can actually download from NASA's website, look how, how crazy is that, right? You can actually go to their website and download this footage for yourself and you can actually see that by watching it at a certain point they clearly forgot to take out the part in which they produce with a computer graphic a very 
an expensive computer probably, the ISS in a computer lab. Or if you know how CGI is done, usually they start off by black and white and no texture, no color, right? Just the 3D model. And this is exactly what you're seeing on this video. And nothing's wrong with it. You just say, yeah, that's the ISS at a very high altitude, 408 kilometers. This is bummer, a bummer, huge bummer. Now, this doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean that all of their feeds, all of the NASA ISS feeds are fake. It doesn't. It means that this exact STS mission, uh, what you're seeing there, what we believe to be the ISS at night is a CGI, computer graphics generator, whatever, right? And the exact proof is, the 100% the, the proof that you want to see is the fact that the real ISS, what's supposed to be, of course, the real ISS that's showing up on screen, you can only see a small part of it that's being uh, illuminated or, or lightened by, I don't know, maybe artificial light, whatever, right? And you can't see the wings, right? You can't see the solar panels. But when the computer graphics kicks in, suddenly you can see the entire ISS, including the solar panel. In which was everything was working just fine for them. And all of a sudden, they, you know, just, I don't know what happens, folks. I believe this was a mistake, a really big mistake, and they didn't double check it. Or if they did, someone wanted us to see this. This is what makes me think even that it might be a bigger conspiracy, whatever. But, well, I don't know if you know this. All of the imagery, all of the image that NASA provides us with Earth from far away, Moon from far away, planets such as Saturn, Venus. For example, let's just play a small video of one of these planets. And in the credits of the video, you can clearly see that they put, or not necessarily in the credits, but somewhere... In these pictures and videos, they put that it's produced in the NASA laboratory by a computer graphic uh, industry, whatever company. So, basically, they're saying, look, guys, everything we're showing you is computer generated, right? But if by any chance you don't get to see the credits, you will never know. So, it's very interesting until now. Uh, after all these years, I believe we have 40 to 50 years after the moon landing, I believe that we should already have, number one, a moon base, a very well-established moon base, right? With, including, with, right, including a live feed of the Earth. Okay. And this is something we don't have. Uh, and I'm talking about like a 4K ultra-high definition 60 frames per second whatever the best that they have that we are paying for feed of earth from the moon but they don't this is complicated folks it is complicated uh, but the first thing that comes to my mind is that they're hiding something the rain again it's raining yeah it's raining again have to go see you guys I started reading this it's one of these things in your life when you read it it uh, you'll never forget it or i'll never forget this i'll never forget it because of the implications involved in it first of all it's the testimony of an honorable man admiral he's an admiral he's gone on now but admiral uh uh bird richard bird here's the man who flew over the north pole and was awarded the congressional medal of honor and i read the the uh, statement uh, attached to that, how that he risked his life and so forth. He flew over the South Pole. That's not all he did, though. After the war, he led an expedition to South America 
with over 4,000 troops and 8, 9, 10, 12 warships. And uh, it was called Operation High Jump. I never heard of it. But when you find out about one thing, it leads to another thing. raises his altitude, standard procedures of any pilot. And uh, he does this, and he talks about how he does it, and uh, continues to fly. He has, uh, he has constant radio checks with his base, so they'll know where he is, they keep up with him. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have GPS and all of that stuff, so uh, they flew by what's called dead reckoning a lot of times. And pilots know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about dead reckoning. At, uh, at, uh, he continues to he continues to talk to them until he gets down until he until he comes he's flying over the ice he's flying over the North Pole and what do you expect to see Con- nothing but ice that's what you expect to see one sheet of ice after another sheet just solid white ice snow the North Pole until uh, he uh, he sees a creature down below which looks to him like a mammoth and he drops his altitude to about 1400 feet and it is a mammoth and uh, uh, this begins to really get his attention uh, he sees a mountain range and in uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning so now he's been in the air for four hours he says he crosses over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best can be ascertained beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below, no green valley in North in, in, in Arctic in the Arctic, no green valley. And uh, something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. He says we should be over ice and snow. To the port side, port is left, starboard is right. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigator. Our navigation instruments are still spinning, and the reason they're spinning is because he's approaching magnetic north. And if you and the magnetic pole, if you ever get around the magnetic pole, you forget your 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 magnetic compass. It's not going to work because the magnetism is so intense, and 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 the movement is so great that you that it's going to have this going, people. That's right. He says uh, his uh, his navigational instruments are spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Then he sees this beneath, and he says, "At fourteen hundred feet, and I execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or some type of tight knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore." We make another left turn, and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, he says, yet there it is. He decreases his altitude to 1,000 feet, and, take, and he takes binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed it is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. At 10, uh, 10.30 hours, he encountered more rolling green hills. The external temperature indicator reached 74 degrees Fahrenheit. He's in the North Pole. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio's not functioning. And now what follows is one of the most incredible things I've ever read in my life. And let me put it in the context of this. When Satan showed the Lord Jesus Christ the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, he did just that. He has power. And uh, there are things going on that there is absolutely no physical definition or logical reasoning to. But the existence of it cannot be denied. And this is what's happening here. In 1130 hours, countryside below is more level than normal. If I may use that word ahead, we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. 
The controls refuse to respond. My God, he says, off our port and starboard wings, a strange type of aircraft. They're closing rapidly alongside. They're disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We're caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in, uh, in what appears to, in English with what appears to be a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The, the message is, welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. In other words, he's been taken over completely. Now, up to this point, you're going to say to yourself, well, this is a madman. Or you may say to yourself, I know the power of the devil. I know how he can deceive. And what follows, he is taken into a city by blonde-haired men who look like these Aryans that Hitler and the rest of them were talking about in Germany. And then he's finally taken to their leader. And when, he take, when he's taken to their leader, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, he has sorry, a conversation sorry, yeah. with him. He's their master. And that master tells him that essentially that they've been observing us on top of the earth where we live for a long time. And that we have gotten to the point by killing each other. And they're talking about the atomic bomb that had been just been recently dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know those two. This happened 1940, uh, in 1947, I think this happened. And they were saying that we are going to have to do something with the people who dwell on earth. They tell Admiral Byrd that he's an honorable man, and they ask, and he asks him, why am I here? He, they said, because you're chosen to be here. You're a man that we can trust. We're going to tell you what's happening. We're going to tell you all of this. They tell him. They send him back. So he goes back and he tells his, his superiors. And uh, apparently they tell him to hush this up. This stays, this stays hush, hush, until right before he dies, this diary comes out. Because he said, I cannot leave this world without letting humanity know what has happened. I cannot leave. I must tell them what happened. Before we go any further, let's ask ourselves some questions. Number one, did he write this diary? Is this Admiral Byrd's diary? Did he really, did he really write this? Number two, if he really did write this, and this is legitimate, this is his diary, then something obviously happened to this man when he was over the North Pole. Something happened. Something obviously happened to this man. Number three, regardless of whatever happened to this man, he's convinced something happened to him. So it's it's incumbent upon us what did happen to him when he was over the North Pole. All right. If you press, if you press this thing a little further and do a little more studying into it, you'll find out that there's an awful lot of people out there that believe the Earth is hollow. That it's not it's not uh, it's not a it, there's not a molten mass in it like they say now. If you're a Bible believer, you know this. You know that the heart of this earth, hell, is located. If you believe the Bible, all right? If you believe the Bible. And if you believe the Bible, the book of Revelation makes it very plain that the bottomless pit, which is hell, was opened. And out of that pit came these creatures upon the earth. They're coming out on the earth. They're coming out on the face of the earth. Now, that's a wild thing. This is why a lot of churches in this country, an awful lot of churches in this country, absolutely refuse to read or study the book of revelation or preach from it because it has some things in it that just literally blow your mind and that's one of them talking about creatures coming up out of the bottomless pit apollyon and the bat and all of that but if i'm a, and i'm a bible believer i believe it's real all right you can get off and you can get way out in left field with a hollow earth theory all right and you can get in deep and all of this stuff that i'm just kind of going to I'm just going to present it to you this morning in the context of what we're studying, because we're studying, we're studying a, 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 uh, a deceit that's coming on this earth of unbelievable proportions, a deceit, all right, a deceit. Now, we know that Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, when he was Chancellor of Germany, was deep into the occult. We know they didn't do anything unless they consulted their occult masters and prognosticators and what have you. And the German, the German high command, Himmler, men like that, 
Even Himmler himself was far more into the occult than Hitler, and Hitler was head over heels into it, but Himmler was deep into it. Uh, these men were guided every moment of their life by a, an occult, satanic power and spirit. Germany, Germany did definitely develop during World War II some of the highest technology on the earth. I saw this the other day on the History Channel, and I didn't know this. Nobody had ever told me this. But this is what the History Channel reported. That two German scientists in the 30s, in the 30s, these two German scientists had split the atom. Now think hard on that. Think hard on that. And it was the German scientists, Werner, Werner von Braun, men like that, who got America into space. That's a fact, folks. That's a fact. No question about that. The only reason they didn't put them to death at Nuremberg with the trials was because they needed them. And so they, they needed their technology, what have you. Anyway, Germany uh, apparently was, was, was way ahead of the rest of the world in some of this technology. Germany had a society called the Vril Society, V-R-I-L. How many's ever heard that term? Most people haven't, but a few of you have, all right? That's, a, that's, a, that's an occult society. But the premise of the Vril Society was this. They were able to tap into satanic power and apply it to physical things. See? They were able to tap into satanic, to occult power. They called it, a, they called it whatever force they called it. We know what it is. The power is either of God or the devil. But they tapped into it. And they were able to apply it to physical things. There are photographs of flying saucers the Germans made. I've seen them, but they're not flying saucers like, like, you know, the classic example of them, but they are flying saucers. In other words, they are propelled by a propulsion, si propulsion system that was unknown by most of the world at that time. But in any event, the bottom line is that the Germans had tapped into the occult world and had begun to, to, uh, to, to build this system based on what they were getting from the occult world. And that system was, was this. They believed that in the north, in the north, they believed in the north, that there was an entrance into a hollow earth and that spirit beings lived there that were vastly superior to us. And that these spirit beings were our forefathers. And that's what we, he, Hitler was trying to do was to try to bring the race back, the Aryan race back to its roots, back to what it should be. And this is why the root race theory is so important when you get into this stuff. You remember I told you about the root race? You remember what rate, what, which one I told you the Aryan was? There's seven of them. Five, exactly. Five. It's number five. It's the fifth. And this root race theory, the Theosophists taught it. Blavatsky in Russia taught it. All of this, all of this evolutionary, spiritual evolutionary that brings this super race, this super identity. These people believe that. The evolution, when you talk about biological evolution, all right, you're talking about what they teach at UT and all the major colleges in the world. They teach biological evolution. What is biological evolution? That's what Charles Darwin taught, right? All right, that's simple enough on the surface of it for people to relate to. Biological evolution, I don't believe it, but they, that's what they teach. All right, then there is social evolution. All right, political correctness is a product of social evolution. What's social evolution? What if biological evolution is true? Then social evolution is where the, is where the masses and humanity and governments are able to uh, learn how to live, uh, live, in, live in peace and blah, blah, and so forth. In plain words, social evolution means that there must be a one world government for men to live. That's social evolution. See, that's not biological evolution. But the idea is that if evolution is true, they believe it is, then therefore there must, that, that justifies the idea, well, men, men must live together. Then there is... Then there is this esoteric, this spiritual, this, this stuff here we're talking about that Admiral Byrd saw. There is that type of evolution. And this gets into the very, this gets into the mystical category of it. 
because this gets into that highbrow stuff about the spirit beings that are channelers and guides and are communicating with people. And the U.S. government would never tell you this, but they've got all kinds of right. experiments in right. this, and they've got labs, and they've got an yes, underground they labs, and they're doing experimentation into this stuff, and, they're, and, and, and all of this is going on right now, and people go off on the deep end when they get into it and you got to be awful careful with it because you, can't. you can get into this stuff and you can become possessed by these of course you go off the deep end of course you somewhat get possessed by it because you realize everything you've ever been told is a lie and everybody around you is being lied to and you can't even open their eyes because they won't even start to recognize the first lie ever told the biggest the greatest lie ever he said he would come and deceive the world. Well, guess what? He came and started to deceive the world over 400 years ago when they told you that you lived on a wet ball spinning rocket. So, once you can pass that lie off, I mean, give me a break. You can get anybody to believe anything after that, right? Alright, sorry, here we go, guys. Because these are demons. And these demons are smart. Yes, they Admiral are. Bird saw something. I don't doubt that for a minute. But he did not see a civilization of advanced beings that had evolved to that point. What he saw was either an apparition or a physical manifestation of some spirit power that's demonic. That's what he saw. But it blows my mind okay, to realize sorry. how powerful it is. Sorry, hold on. I'm going to say to you. I think that he found the fallen angels that somehow found the way to survive or it's a breakaway technology. I mean, if you even just look about from what we know 5,000 years ago, we could have had an industrial revolution. I mean, they, under they actually understood the power of steam engines. And then when you see things that we find nowadays, like that we could almost consider as a computer and it's you know, literally, you know, anywhere from five to 10,000 years old, if not even older. And I mean, not to say it's a computer that we would say of nowadays, but enough of one that within a hundred years, it, you know, it would have become to be what we have. It, it's amazing. This morning, I want to say, I want to say it to you. And I want you to take it to heart. When the deception comes, if you're not a born-again believer, you'll be swept away with it. The deception will be greater than you ever imagined in your life. It is going to be profound as to what happens. When Ted Gunderson talked about, now put it together, he talked about people in the high places are Satanist. What he's talking about, they're Illuminati. He's talking about spiritual power in high places that will bring about a one world government. And by doing that, they intend to rule the world. And they have the help of a whole, I don't know, what, you, what do you call it, a, a mass of demonic spirits who are able to perform all kinds of miracles, deceptive miracles, manifestations and all of this stuff to help them to bring about that one world government and the goal is so that they can put one man up and worship him as God the Antichrist now there is a mind behind all of it there's a mind directing it and that mind is the devil it's Lucifer he wants worship he wants worship he 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 covets worship he does. The money's nothing to him. And the souls of men. And power's nothing to him. He's got power. He covets worship. That's why he said to the Lord Jesus Christ, you fall down and worship me. And I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. He covets it. Now, now when you look around yourself, and I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, I've, I've talked about bird and I've talked about this other stuff. you got to ask yourself the question. Well, how long is it going to be then? I mean, they've got all this technology. They've got all this stuff going. How long is it going to be before they bring this together and they do it? They're already doing it. It's already happening. It's already happening. When you look outside, how many of you have noticed these little antennas that, are, that have a square box on top of them? That's ELF. That's an ELF antenna. You know what that's for? Ostensibly, 
It's for this. Send frequencies into your head. And you wonder why. Why is it that I, I'm thirsty? Or why would I like to have an ice cream? Or what? You know, all of a sudden, you know, this desire hits you. It's because they're feeding this stuff into your brain. Now, you say, well, now that's crazy, preacher. You know, that they wouldn't do that. The government wouldn't do that. Would they? Worlds beyond the poles. Physical continuity of the universe. This book was published in 1959. These days, the book sells on eBay for around $500. I was blown away by this book. If you research stuff like Flat Earth or Hollow Earth, you have to read this book. Let me read the first page of the book, which is very telling. The following pages contain the first and only description of the realistic universe of land, water, oxygen and vegetation where human and other forms of animal life abound. This is not a work of fiction, nor is it a technical analysis of anything. It is a simple recital of fact which transcends the most elaborate fiction ever conceived. It is diametrically opposed to the assumptions and mathematical conclusions of theorists and technicians throughout the ages. It is truth. These pages describe the physical land routes from the Earth to every land area of the universe about us, which is all land. Such routes extend from beyond the North Pole and South Pole so-called ends of the Earth as decreed by theory. It will here be shown that there are no northern or southern limits to the Earth. It will thereby be shown where movement straight ahead from the pole points and on the same level as the Earth permits of movement into celestial land areas appearing up or out from the Earth. A basic version of this book was written and has been expounded at American universities between 1927 and 1930. Since then, the U.S. Naval Research Bureau and the U.S. Navy have conclusively confirmed the work's principal features. Since December of 1928, U.S. Navy polar expeditions have determined the existence of land extent beyond both pole points. Out of bounds of the assumed isolated globe, Earth as postulated by the Copernican theory. On January 13 of 1956, as this book was 